book the fifth chapter five of charlotte's inheritance this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org charlotte's inheritance by mary elizabeth braddon chapter five assurance doubly sure on the day after miss paget's departure mr sheldon came home from the city rather earlier than usual and found charlotte alone in the drawing-room reading a ponderous volume from moody of an instructive and edifying character with a view to making herself clever in order that she might better understand that prodigy of learning mr hawkehurst she was somewhat inclined to yawn over the big book which contained a graphic account of recent discoveries of an antiquarian nature her mind was not yet attuned to the comprehension of the sublimer elements in such discoveries she saw only a dry as dust record of feudal gropings in desert sand for the traces of perished empires her imagination was not cultivated to that point whereat the gift which mr lewes calls insight becomes the daily companion nay indeed the ever haunting and nightmare-bringing influence of the dreamer for her sands were only sands the stones were only stones no splendour of fallen palaces no glory and pride of perished kings no clash and clamour of vanished courts arose from those barren sands with all their pomp and circumstance conjured into being by half a word on a broken pillar or a date upon a punic monument miss halliday looked up with a sigh of fatigue as her stepfather came into the room it was not a room that he particularly affected and she was surprised when he seated himself in the easy-chair opposite her and poked the fire as if with the intention of remaining you shouldn't read by firelight my dear he said it is most destructive to the eyesight i dare say my sight will last my time papa the young lady replied carelessly but it's very kind of you to think of it and i won't read any more mr sheldon made no reply to this observation he sat looking at the fire with that steady gaze which was habitual to him the gaze of the man who plans and calculates my dear he said by and by it seems that this money to which you may or may not be entitled is more than we thought at first in fact it appears that the sum is a considerable one i have been and still am particularly anxious to guard against disappointment on your part as i know the effect that such a disappointment is apt to produce upon a person's life the harassing slowness of chancery proceedings is proverbial i am therefore especially desirous that you should not count upon this money i shall never do that papa i should certainly like a fine edition of the encyclopaedia britannica for valentine by and by as he says that is essential for a literary man and a horse for people say literary men ought to take horse exercise but beyond that we need scarcely go into these details my dear i want you to understand the broad facts of the case while on the one hand our success in obtaining the inheritance which we are about to claim for you is uncertain on the other hand the inheritance is large of course when i presented you with the sum of five thousand pounds i had no idea of this possible inheritance oh of course not papa but i now find that there is such a possibility as your becoming a well a rich woman oh papa in which case i may conclude that your mother would benefit in some measure from your good fortune can you doubt that papa there should be no measure to her benefit from any money obtained by me i do not doubt that my dear and it is with that idea that i wish to make a proposition to you for your mother's possible advantage i shall be happy to do anything you wish papa it must be done as a spontaneous act of your own charlotte not in accordance with any wish of mine what is it that i am to do asked charlotte well my dear you see it is agreed between us that if you do get this money your mother is certain to benefit considerably 
but unhappily the proceedings are likely to drag on for an indefinite time and in the course of that time it comes within the limits of possibility that your decease may precede that of your mother yes papa in which case your mother would lose all hope of any such advantage of course papa charlotte could not help thinking that there was something sordid in this discussion this calculation of possible gain or loss contingent on her fresh young life but she concluded that it was the nature of business men to see everything from a debased standpoint and that mr sheldon was no more sordid than other men of his class well papa she asked presently after some moments of silence during which she and her stepfather had both been absorbed in the contemplation of the fire well my dear replied mr sheldon slowly i have been thinking that the natural and easy way of guarding against all contingencies would be by your effecting an insurance on your life in your mother's favour no no papa cried charlotte with unwonted vehemence i would rather do anything than that what can be your objection to such a very simple arrangement i dare say my objection seems foolish childish even papa but i really have a horror of life assurances i always think of papa my own poor father whom i love so dearly it seemed as if he put a price upon his life for us he was so anxious to insure his life i remember hearing him talk of it at highly when i was a child to make things straight as he said for us and you see very soon afterwards he died but you can't suppose the insurance of his life had anything to do with his death of course not i'm not so childish as that only only you have a foolish lackadaisical prejudice against the only means by which you can protect your mother against a contingency that is so remote as to be scarcely worth consideration let it pass there was more anger in the tone than in the words it was not that angry tone but the mention of her mother that impressed miss halliday she began to consider that her objections were both foolish and selfish if you really think i ought to insure my life i will do so she said presently papa did as much for those he loved why should i be less thoughtful of others having once brought miss halliday to this frame of mind the rest was easy it was agreed between them that as valentine hawkehurst was to be kept in ignorance of his betrothed's claim to certain monies now in the shadowy underworld of chancery so he must be kept in ignorance of the insurance it was only one more secret and charlotte had learned that it was possible to keep a secret from her lover i suppose before we are married i shall be able to tell him everything she said certainly my dear all i want is to test his endurance and his prudence if the course of events proves him worthy of being trusted i will trust him i am not afraid of that papa of course not my dear but you see i have to protect your interests and i cannot afford to see this gentleman with your eyes i am compelled to be prudent the stockbroker sighed as he said this a sigh of utter weariness remorse was unknown to him the finer fibres upon which that chord is struck had not been employed in the fabrication of his heart but there is a mental fatigue which is a spurious kind of remorse and has all the anguish of the nobler feeling it is an utter weariness and prostration of spirit a sickness of heart and mind a bitter longing to lie down and die the weariness of a beaten hound rather than of a baffled man this was what mr sheldon felt as the threads of the web which he was weaving multiplied and grew daily and hourly more difficult of manipulation success in the work which he had to do depended on so many contingencies afar off glittered the splendid goal the undisputed possession of the late john haygarth's hundred thousand pounds but between the schemer and that chief end and aim of all his plottings what a sea of troubles 
he folded his arms behind his head and looked across the girlish face of his companion into the shadow and the darkness in those calculations which were forever working themselves out in this man's brain charlotte halliday was only one among many figures she had her fixed value in every sum but her beauty her youth her innocence her love her trust made no unit of that fixed figure nor weighed in the slightest degree with him who added up the sum had she been old ugly obnoxious a creature scarcely fit to live she would have represented exactly the same amount in the calculations of philip sheldon the graces that made her beautiful were graces that he had no power to estimate he knew she was a pretty woman but he knew also that there were pretty women to be seen in any london street and the difference between his stepdaughter and the lowest of womankind who passed him in his daily walks was to him little more than a social prejudice the insurance business being once decided on mr sheldon lost no time in putting it into execution although he made a point of secrecy as regarded mr hawkehurst he went to work in no underhand manner but managed matters after a highly artistic and superior fashion he took his stepdaughter to the offices of greenwood and greenwood and explained her wishes to one of those gentlemen in her presence if he dwelt a little more on miss halliday's anxiety for her mother's pecuniary advantage than his previous conversation with miss halliday warranted the young lady was too confiding and too diffident to contradict him she allowed him to state or rather to imply that the proposed insurance was her spontaneous wish an emanation of her anxious and affectionate heart the natural result of an almost morbid care for her mother's welfare mr hargrave greenwood of greenwood and greenwood seemed at first inclined to throw cold water on the proposition but after some little debate agreed that extreme caution would certainly counsel such a step i should imagine there was no better life amongst the inhabitants of london he said than miss shell pardon me miss halliday's but as the young lady herself suggests in the midst of life we are and as the young lady herself has observed these things are <clears throat> beyond human foresight if there were any truth in the aphorisms of poets i should say miss halliday cannot insure too quickly for the remark of cowper or stay i believe pope whom the gods love die young might very well be supposed to apply to so charming a young lady happily the secretaries of insurance offices know very little about the poets unless indeed miss halliday were to go to the royal widows and orphans hope the secretary of which is the author of dramas that may fairly rank with the works of knowles and lytton mr greenwood an elderly gentleman of the ponderous and port wine school laughed at his own small jokes and took things altogether pleasantly he gave mr sheldon a letter of introduction to the secretary of his pet insurance company the value of which to that gentleman was considerable nor was this the only advantage derived from the interview the lawyer's approval of the transaction reassured charlotte and though she had heard her own views somewhat misrepresented she felt that an operation which appeared wise in the sight of such a lawyer standing on such a turkey hearth-rug commanding such gentlemanly-looking clerks as those who came and went at mr greenwood's bidding must inevitably be a proceeding at once prudent and proper the business of the insurance was not quite so easy as the interview with the lawyer the doctor to whom miss halliday was introduced seemed very well satisfied with that young lady's appearance of health and spirits but in a subsequent interview with mr sheldon asked several questions and shook his head gravely when told that her father had died at thirty-seven years of age but he looked less grave when informed that mr halliday had died of a bilious fever did mr halliday die in london he asked he did i should like <clears throat> if it were possible to see the medical man who attended him these fevers rarely prove fatal unless there is some predisposing cause in this case there was none 
you speak rather confidently mr sheldon as a non-professional man i speak with a certain amount of professional knowledge i knew tom halliday for many years mr sheldon forbore to state that tom halliday had died in his house and had been attended by him it is perhaps only natural that philip sheldon the stockbroker of repute should wish to escape identification with philip sheldon the unsuccessful dentist of bloomsbury after a little more conversational skirmishing the confidential physician of the prudential step assurance company agreed to consider that mr halliday's constitution had been in no manner compromised by his early death and to pass charlotte's life the motives for effecting the insurance were briefly touched upon in mr greenwood's letter of introduction and appeared very proper and feasible in the eyes of the directors so after a delay of a few days the young lady found herself accepted and mr sheldon put away among his more important papers a large oblong envelope containing a policy of assurance on his stepdaughter's life for five thousand pounds he did not however stop here but made assurance doubly sure by effecting a second insurance upon the same young life with the widows and orphans hope society within a few days of the first transaction End of chapter five assurance doubly sure book the sixth chapter one of charlotte's inheritance this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org charlotte's inheritance by mary elizabeth braddon diana in normandy at cote noir beau bocage near vevenor march fifteen eighteen sixty something my darling lotta as you extorted from me a solemn pledge that i would write you a full and detailed account of my adventures i seat myself in mademoiselle lenoble's pretty little turret chamber in the hope of completing the first instalment of my work before papa or gustave summons me to prepare for a drive and visit to the convent of the sacred heart which i believe has been planned for to-day what am i to tell you dear and how shall i begin my story let me fancy myself sitting at your feet before your bedroom fire and you looking down at me with that pretty inquisitive look in your dear grey eyes do you know that monsieur lenoble's eyes are almost the colour of yours lotta you asked me a dozen questions about his eyes the other day and i could give you no clear description of them but yesterday as he stood at the window looking out across the garden i saw their real colour it is grey a deep clear grey and his lashes are dark like yours how shall i begin that is the grand difficulty i suppose you will want to know something even about the journey everything was very pleasant in spite of the cold blusterous march weather do you know what my last journey was like lotta it was the long dreary journey from forêt de chene to st catherine's wharf when mr hawkehurst advised and arranged my return to england i had been sitting quite alone in a balcony overlooking the little town it was after midnight but the lights were still burning i can see the lamp-lit windows shining through the night mist as i write this and the sense of the hopeless misery of that time comes back to me like the breath of some freezing wind i can find no words to tell you how desolate i was that night or how hopeless i dared not think of my future life or of the next day that was to be the beginning of that hopeless future i was obliged to bind my thoughts to the present in all its dreariness and a kind of dull apathetic feeling which was too dull for despair took possession of me that night while i was sitting there mr hawkehurst came to me and told me that my father had become involved in a quarrel under circumstances of a very shameful nature which i need not tell you darling 
he recommended me to leave for at de chen indeed almost insisted that i should do so he wanted to rescue me from that miserable life your lover had noble and generous impulses even then you see dear at his worst he was not all bad and needed only your gentle influence to purify and elevate his character he gave me all the money he possessed to pay the expenses of my journey ah what a dreary journey i left foray de chen in the chill daybreak and travelled third class with dreadful belgians who smelt of garlic to antwerp i slept at a very humble inn near the quay and started for england by the baron osi at noon next day i cannot tell you how lonely i felt on board the steamer i had travelled uncomfortably before but never without my father and valentine and he had been always kind to me if we were shabbily dressed and people thought ill of us i did not care the spirit of bohemianism must have been very strong with me in those days i remembered how we had sat together on the same boat watching the sleepy shores of holland or making fun of our respectable fellow-passengers now i was quite alone people stared at me rudely and unkindly as i thought i could not afford to dine or breakfast with the rest and i was weak enough to feel wounded by the idea that people would guess my motive for shunning the savoury banquets that sent up such horrid odours to the deck where i sat trying to read a tattered tauchnitz novel and the end of my journey ah charlotte you can never imagine what it is to travel like that without knowing whether there is any haven any shelter for you at the end of your wanderings i knew that at a certain hour we were to arrive at st catherine's dock but beyond that i knew nothing i counted my money there was just enough to pay for a cab that would carry me to hyde lodge i should land there penniless and what if my cousin priscilla should refuse to receive me for a moment i fancied even that possible and i pictured myself walking about london hungry and homeless this was my last journey i have dwelt upon it longer than i need have done but i want you to understand what it is that makes gustave lenoble dear to me if you could feel the contrast between the past and the present as i felt it when i stood on the deck of the dover packet with him by my side you would know why i love him and am grateful to him we stood side by side watching the waves and talking of our future while my father enjoyed a nap in one of the little deck cabins to gustave that future seems very bright and clear to me it seems unutterably strange that the future can be anything but a dismal terra incognita from the contemplation of which it is wise to refrain papa stays with gustave at cote noir but it had been arranged for me to visit mademoiselle lenoble gustave's aunt at beau bocage and to remain with her during my stay in normandy i at once understood the delicate feeling which prompted this arrangement we dined at rouen and came to vivenor in a coach at vivenor a queer little countrified vehicle met us with a very old man of the farm servant class as coachman gustave took the reins from the old man's hand and drove to beaubocage where mademoiselle lenoble received me with much cordiality she is a dear old lady with silvery bands of hair neatly arranged under the prettiest of caps her gown is black silk and her collar and cuffs of snowy whiteness everything about her exquisitely neat and of the fashion of twenty or perhaps thirty years ago and now i suppose you will want to know what bobocage is like well dear much as i admire mademoiselle lenoble i must confess that her ancestral mansion is neither grand nor pretty it might have made a very tolerable farmhouse but has been spoiled by the architect's determination to make it a chateau it is a square white building with two pepper castor like turrets in one of which i write this letter between the garden and the high road there is a wall surmounted with plaster vases the garden is for the greater part utilitarian but in front of the salon windows there is a grass plot bordered by stiff gravel walks and relieved by a couple of flower-beds 
a row of tall poplars alone screens the house from the dusty high road at the back of it there is an orchard on one side a farmyard behind the orchard lie the fields that compose the farm of bobocage and the paternal estate of the lenoble family all around the country is very flat the people seem to be kind and simple and devotedly attached to mademoiselle there is a rustic peacefulness pervading everything which for me stands instead of beauty i am a hypocrite enough to pretend to be pleased with everything for i can perceive how anxiously m lenoble watches me in order to discover whether i like his native country he was not born at bobocage but in paris mademoiselle lenoble told me the story of his childhood and how she brought him to bobocage when quite a little fellow from rouen where his father died about his mother there seems to have been some mystery mademoiselle told me nothing of this except that her brother gustave the elder made a love-match and thereby offended his father she has the little crib in which her nephew gustave the younger slept on the night of his coming it had been his father's little bed thirty years before she shed tears as she told me the story and how she sat and watched by the little fellow as he cried himself to sleep with his head lying on her arm and the summer moonlight shining full upon his face i was deeply touched by her manner as she told me these things and i think if i had not already learned to love m lenoble i should love him for the sake of his aunt she is charming a creature so innocent and pure that one considers one's words in speaking to her almost as if she were a child she is about forty years older than i yet for worlds i would not tell her of the people and the scenes i have beheld at foreign watering-places and gambling-rooms she has spent the sixty years of her life so completely out of the world that she has retained the freshness and sweetness of her youth untainted in the least degree can there be magical filter equal to this a pure unselfish life far away from the clamour of cities the old servant who waits upon me is seventy-five years of age and remembers mademoiselle sidelys from her childhood she is always singing the praises of her mistress and she sees that i like to hear them ah mademoiselle she said to me to marry a lenoble is to marry one of the angels i will not say that the old seigneur was not hard towards his son ah yes but it was a noble heart and the young monsieur that one who died in rouen the poor ah that he was kind that he was gracious what of tears what of regrets when the old chased him my position is quite recognized i think the very cowboy in the farmyard a broad-shouldered lad with a good-natured mindless face and prodigious wooden shoes like clumsy canoes even the cowboy knows that i am to be madame lenoble of cote noire cote noire is the windsor castle of this district bobocage is only frogmore yes dear the bond is signed and sealed even if i did not love m lenoble i have bound myself to marry him but i do love him and thank him with all my heart for having given a definite end and aim to my life don't think i underrate your kindness darling i know that i should never want a home while you could give me one but tis to be a hanger-on in any household and valentine will exact all his sweet young wife's love and care i have written you a letter which i am sure will require double postage so i will say no more except good-bye take care of yourself dear one practise your part in our favourite duets remember your morning walk in the garden and don't wear out your eyes over the big books that mr hawkehurst is obliged to read ever your affectionate diana from charlotte halliday to diana paget the dullest house in christendom monday ever dearest di your letter was a welcome relief to the weariness of my existence how i wish i were with you but that is too bright a dream i am sure i should idolize bobocage i should not mind the dismal row of poplars or the flat landscape or the dusty road or anything so long as it was not like bayswater 
i languish for a change dear i have seen so little of the world except the dear moreland farmhouse at newhall i don't think i was ever created to be cabined cribbed confined in such a narrow life as this amid such a dull unchanging round of daily commonplace sometimes when the cold spring moon is shining over the tree-tops in kensington gardens i think of switzerland and the snow-clad mountains and fair alpine valleys we have read of and talked of until my heart aches at the thought that i may never see them and to think that there are people in whom the word savoy awakes no fairer image than a cabbage ah my poor dear isn't it almost wicked of me to complain when you have had such bitter experience of the hard cruel world i am quite in love with your dear mademoiselle lenoble almost as deeply as i am in love with your magnanimous chivalrous generous audacious everything ending in us monsieur lenoble how dare you call him monsieur lenoble by the by i have counted the occasions on which you write of him in your nice long letter and for one gustave there are half a dozen monsieur lenobles it must be gustave in future to me remember what shall i tell you dear i have nothing to tell really nothing to say that i wish you were with me is only to confess that i am very selfish but i do wish for you dear my friend and adopted sister my old school companion from whom willingly i have never concealed one thought valentine called on tuesday afternoon but i have nothing to tell you even about him mamma dozed in her corner after her cup of tea and val and i sat by the fire talking over our future just like you monsieur lenoble on board the calais boat how much engaged people find to say about the future is it our love that makes it seem so bright so different from all that has gone before i cannot fancy life with valentine otherwise than happy i strive to picture trials and fancy myself in prison with him the wind blowing in at broken windows the rain coming through the dilapidated roof and pattering on the carpetless floor but the most dismal picture i can paint won't seem dismal if his figure is a part of it we would stop the broken windows with rags and paper we would wipe up the rain with our pocket handkerchiefs and sit side by side and talk of the future as we do now hope could never abandon us while we were together and then sometimes while i am looking at valentine the thought that he might die comes to me suddenly like the touch of an icy hand upon my heart i lie awake at night sometimes thinking of this and of papa's early death he came home one night with a cold and from that hour grew worse until he died ah think what misery for a wife to suffer happily for mamma she is not capable of suffering intensely she was very sorry and even now when she speaks of papa she cries a little but the tears don't hurt her i think indeed they give her a kind of pleasure see dear what a long egotistical letter i have written after all i will say no more except that while i am delighted to think of your pleasure among new friends and new scenes my selfish heart still longs for the hour that is to bring you back to me pray tell me all you can about your daughters that are to be ever and ever your loving charlotte from diana paget to charlotte halliday Bobocage near Vevinor, March thirty, eighteen sixty something. My dear Lotta, in three days more I hope to be with you, but I suppose in the meantime I must keep my promise and send you a faithful account of my life here. Every one here is more kind to me than words can tell, and I have nothing left to wish for except that you were here to be delighted, as I am sure you would be, with the freshness and the strangeness of everything. If I ever do become Madame Lenoble, and even yet I cannot picture to myself that such a thing will be, you must come to Cote Noire, you and Valentine i was taken through every room in the old chateau the day before yesterday and i fixed in my own mind upon the rooms i will give you if these things come to pass they are very old rooms and i can fancy what strange people must have lived in them and died in them perhaps in the days that are gone but if you come to them they shall be made bright and pretty and we will chase the shadows of the mediaeval age away 
there are old pictures old musical instruments quaint spindle-legged chairs and tables tapestries that crumble as you touch them the ashes and relics of many generations gustav says we will sweep these poor vestiges away and begin a new life when i come to cote noire but i cannot find it in my heart to obliterate every trace of those dead feet that have come and gone in all the dusky passages of my future home and now i must tell you about my daughters that are to be my daughter that is i may say of the elder for i love her so well already that no breach between gustav and me could rob her of my affection she is the dearest most loving of creatures and she reminds me of you i dare say you will laugh at this dear and mind i do not say that clarice lenoble is actually like you in complexion or feature those common attributes which every eye can see the resemblance is far more subtle there is a look in this dear girl's face a smile and i know not what which every now and then recalls your own bright countenance you will say this is mere fancy and that is what i told myself at the first but i found afterwards that it is no fancy but really one of those vague indefinable accidental likenesses which one perceives so often to me it seems a very happy accident for my first glance at my daughter's face told me that i should love her for your sake we went to the convent the day before yesterday it is a curious old place and was once a stately chateau the habitation of a noble family a little portress in the black robes of a lay sister admitted us and conducted us to the parlour a fine old room decorated with pictures of a religious character painted by members of the sisterhood here gustave and i were received by the superioress an elderly woman with a mild holy face and a quiet grace of manner which might become a duchess she sent for the demoiselles lenoble and after a delay of a quarter of an hour you remember the toilet the girls at hyde lodge were obliged to make before they went to the drawing-room lotta mademoiselle lenoble came a tall slim lovely and lovable girl who reminded me of the dearest friend i have in this world she ran to her papa first and saluted him with an enthusiastic hug and then she stood for a moment looking shyly at me confused and doubtful it was only for a moment she was left in doubt gustave bent down to whisper something in her ear something for which his letters had in some manner prepared her the fair young face brightened the clear grey eyes looked up at me with a sweet affectionate gaze and she came to me and kissed me i shall love you very much she whispered and i love you very much already i answered in the same confidential manner and i think these few words that one pretty confiding look in her innocent eyes made a tie between us that it would take much to loosen ah lotta what a wide gulf between the diana paget who landed alone at st catherine's wharf in the dim cheerless dawn and uncertain where to find a shelter in all that busy city and the same creature redeemed by your affection and exalted by the love and trust of gustave lenoble after this my second daughter appeared a pretty young hoyden with lovable clinging ways and then the superioress asked if i would like to see the garden of course i said yes and we were taken through the long corridors out into a fine old garden where the pupils who looked like the hyde lodge girls translated into french were prancing and scampering about in the usual style after the garden we went to the chapel where there were more pictures and flower bedecked altars and pale twinkling tapers burning here and there in the chill sunlight here there were damsels engaged in pious meditation from five years old upwards they send even the little ones to meditate clarice tells me and there are these infants kneeling before the flower-bedecked altars wrapped in religious contemplation like so many thomas a Kempises the young meditators glanced shyly at us as we passed when they had shown me everything of special interest in the pleasant old place clarice and madelon ran off to dress for walking in order to accompany us to cote noire where we were to dine it was quite a family party mademoiselle lenoble was there and papa 
he arrived at the chateau while gustave and i were paying our visit to the convent he is in the highest spirits and treats me with an amount of affection and courtesy i have not been accustomed to receive at his hands of course i know the cause of this change the future mistress of Noir is a very different person from that wretched girl who was nothing to him but a burden and an encumbrance but even while i despise him i cannot refuse to pity him one forgives anything in old age in this at least it is a second childhood and my father is very old lotta i saw the look of age in his face more plainly at cote noire where he assumed his usual debonair man of the world tone and manner than i had seen it in london when he was a professed invalid he is much changed since i was with him at forêt de chene it seems as if he had kept time at bay very long and now at last the common enemy will be held at arm's length no longer he still braces himself up in the old military manner still holds himself more erect than many men of half his age but in spite of all this i can see that he is very feeble shaken and worn by a long life of difficulty i am glad to think that there will be a haven for him at last and if i did not thank gustave with my whole heart for giving me a home and a place in the world i should thank him for giving a shelter to my father and now dears i hope to be with you so very soon i shall say no more i am to spend a day in rouen before we come back papa and i that is to say gustave stays in normandy to make some arrangements before he comes back to england i cannot comprehend the business relations between him and papa but there is some business going on law business as it seems to me about which papa is very important and elated i am to see the cathedral and churches at rouen and i shall contrive to see the shops and to bring you something pretty papa has given me money the first he ever gave me unasked i have very little doubt it comes from gustave but i have no sense of shame in accepting it m lenoble's seems to me a royal nature formed to bestow benefits and bounties on every side tell mrs sheldon that i shall bring her the prettiest cap i can find in rouen and with all love believe me ever your affectionate diana End of book the sixth chapter one at cote noire book the seventh a cloud of fear chapter one of charlotte's inheritance this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org charlotte's inheritance by mary elizabeth braddon chapter one the beginning of sorrow who heeds the cloud no bigger than a man's hand amidst a broad expanse of blue ether the faint scarce perceptible menace of that one little cloud is lost in the wide brightness of a summer sky the traveller jogs on contented and unthinking till the hoarse roar of stormy winds or the first big drops of the thunder shower startle him with a sudden consciousness of the coming storm it was early may and the young leaves were green in the avenues of kensington gardens bayswater was bright and gay with fashionable people and mrs sheldon found herself strong enough to enjoy her afternoon drive in hyde park where the contemplation of the bonnets afforded her perennial delight i think they are actually smaller than ever this year she remarked every season and every season the headgear of fashionable london did indeed seem to shrink and dwindle fine by degrees and beautifully less the coal scuttle shaped headdress of our grandmothers had not yet resolved itself into a string of beads and a rosebud in these days but was obviously tending thitherward charlotte and diana accompanied mrs sheldon in her drives the rapture of contemplating the bonnets was not complete unless the lady had some sympathizing spirit to share her delight the two girls were very well pleased to mingle in that brilliant crowd and to go back to their own quiet life when the mystic hour came and that bright vision of colour and beauty 
melted into the twilight loneliness it had seemed just lately however as if charlotte was growing a little weary of the gorgeous spectacle the ever-changing ever splendid diorama of west end life she no longer exclaimed at the sight of each exceptional toilette she no longer smiled admiringly on the thoroughbred horses champing their bits in the immediate neighbourhood of her bonnet she no longer gave a little cry of delight when the big drags came slowly along the crowded ranks the steel bars shining as they swung loosely in the low afternoon sunlight the driver conscious of his glory grave and tranquil with the pride that apes humility see lotta said miss paget upon an especially bright may evening as one of these gorgeous equipages went past mr sheldon's landau there's another drag did you see it yes dear i saw it and are you tired of four in hands you used to admire them so much i admire them as much as ever dear and yet you scarcely gave those four splendid roans a glance no charlotte answered with a faint sigh are you tired lotta miss paget asked rather anxiously there was something in charlotte's manner of late that had inspired her with a vague sense of anxiety some change which she could scarcely define a change so gradual that it was only by comparing the charlotte of some months ago with the charlotte of the present that she perceived how real a change it was the buoyancy and freshness the girlish vivacity of miss halliday's manner were rapidly giving place to habitual listlessness are you tired dear she repeated anxiously and mrs sheldon looked round from her contemplation of the bonnets no di dearest not tired but i don't feel very well this afternoon this was the first confession which charlotte halliday made of a sense of weakness and languor that had been creeping upon her during the last two months so slowly so gradually that the change seemed too insignificant for notice you feel ill lotta dear diana asked well no not exactly ill i can scarcely call it illness i feel rather weak that is really all at this point mrs sheldon chimed in with her eyes on a passing bonnet as she spoke you see you are so dreadfully neglectful of your papa's advice lotta she said in a complaining tone do you like pink roses with mauve arrowfane diana i do not look at that primrose tulle with dead ivy leaves and scarlet berries in the barouche i dare say you have not taken your glass of old port this morning charlotte and have only yourself to thank if you feel weak i did take a glass of port this morning mamma i don't like it but i take it every morning don't like old tawny port that your papa bought at the sale of a bishop of somewhere it's perfectly absurd of you lotta to talk of not liking wine that costs fifteen shillings a bottle and which your papa's friends declare to be worth five and thirty i am sorry it is so expensive mamma but i can't teach myself to think it nice answered charlotte with a smile that sadly lacked the brightness of a few weeks ago i think one requires to go into the city and become a merchant or a stockbroker before one can like that sort of wine what was it valentine quoted in the cheapside about some lady whom somebody loved to love her was a liberal education i think to like old port is a commercial education i am sure such wine ought to do you good said georgie almost querulously she thought this bright blooming creature had no right to be ill headaches and little weaknesses and languors and ladylike ailments were things for which she georgie had taken out a patent and this indisposition of her daughter's was an infringement of copyright i dare say the port will do me good mamma in time no doubt i shall be as strong as that person who strangled lions and snakes and dogs with incalculable heads and all that kind of thing i really wish you would not talk in that absurd manner my dear 
said mrs sheldon with offended dignity i think you really cannot be too grateful for your papa's kind thoughtfulness and anxiety about you i am sure i myself am not so anxious as he is but of course his medical knowledge makes him doubly careful six weeks ago he noticed that you wanted strength tone is what he calls it georgina he said to me charlotte wants tone she is beginning to stoop in a really lamentable manner we must make her take port or bark or something of a strengthening kind and then a day or two afterwards he decided on port and gave me the key of the cellar which is a thing he rarely gives out of his own hands and told me the number of the bin from which i was to take the wine some old wine that he had laid by on purpose for some special occasion and no one is to have it but you and you are to take a glass daily at eleven o'clock mr sheldon is most particular about the hour the regularity of the thing is half the battle in these cases he says and i am sure if you do not observe his wishes and mine charlotte it will be really ungrateful of you but dear mamma i do observe mr papa's wishes i take my glass of port every morning at eleven i go to your cupboard in the breakfast-room and take out my special decanter and my special glass in the most punctiliously precise manner i don't like the wine and i don't like the trouble involved in the ceremony of drinking it but i go through it most religiously to please you and papa and do you mean to say that you do not feel stronger after taking that expensive old port regularly for nearly six weeks i am sorry to say that i do not mamma i think if there is any change it is that i am weaker dear dear me exclaimed mrs sheldon captiously you are really a most extraordinary girl mrs sheldon could almost have found it in her heart to say a most ungrateful girl there did seem a kind of ingratitude in this futile consumption of old port at fifteen shillings a bottle i'll tell you what it is lotta she said presently i am convinced that your illness or your weakness is all fancy why so mamma because if it were real weakness that old port must have made you stronger and the fact that the port does you no good is a proof that your weakness is only fancy girls of your age are so full of fancies look at me and the martyrdom i go through with my nervous headaches which perfectly prostrate me after the least worry or excitement the nerves of my head after going into the butcher's book are perfect agony when you come to have a house to look after and find what it is to have the same saddle of mutton charged for twice over with the most daring impudence or to have capers and curry powder that you know you've never had staring at you from every page of your grocer's book and nothing but your memory between you and utter ruin you'll discover what it is to be really ill in this easy manner did mrs sheldon dismiss the subject of her daughter's illness but it was not so easily dismissed by diana paget who loved her friend with a profound and pure affection than which no sister's love was ever warmer or stronger even valentine's preference for this happy rival had not lessened diana's love for her friend and benefactress she had been jealous of charlotte's happier fate but in the hour when this jealousy was most bitter there had been no wavering in her attachment to this one true and generous friend miss paget was very silent during the homeward drive she understood now what that change had been in her friend which until now had so perplexed her it was a decay of physical strength which had robbed lotta's smile of its brightness her laugh of its merry music it was physical languor that made her so indifferent to the things which had once awakened her girlish enthusiasm the discovery was a very painful one 
diana remembered her experience of hyde lodge the girls who had grown day by day more listless now in the doctor's hands for a day or two now well again and toiling at the old treadmill round of study now sinking into confirmed invalids until the bitter hour in which parents are summoned and the doctor urges rest and the fond mother carries her darling home assured that home comfort and tenderness will speedily restore her her schoolfellows cluster round the carriage to bid her good-bye until next half full of hopeful talk about her swift recovery but when the vacation is over and black monday comes she is not amongst the returning scholars has she not gone up to the higher school and answered ad sum to the call of the great master diana remembered these old experiences with cruel pain girls as bright and lovable as she is have drooped and faded away just when they seem brightest and happiest she thought as she watched charlotte and perceived to-day for the first time that the outline of her fair young cheek had lost its perfect roundness but in such a case love can do nothing except watch and wait that night in the course of that girlish talk in charlotte's bedroom which had become a habit with the two girls diana extorted from her friend a full account of the symptoms which had affected her within the last few weeks pray don't look so anxious dear di she said gaily it is really nothing worth talking of and i knew that if i confessed to feeling ill you and mamma would straightway begin to worry yourselves about me i have felt a little sick and faint sometimes and now and then a sudden dizziness has come over me it is nothing of any consequence and it passes away very quickly sometimes i have a kind of torpid languid feeling which is scarcely unpleasant only strange you know but what does it all amount to except that i am nervous you must have change of air lotta said diana resolutely and change of scene yes no doubt you are nervous you have been kept almost a prisoner in the house through mr sheldon's punctilious nonsense you miss our brisk morning walks in the gardens i dare say if you were to go to yorkshire now to your friends at newhall you would like that change dear wouldn't you yes i should dearly like to see aunt dorothy and uncle joe but-but what darling i should scarcely like being at newhall unless you'll think me very foolish di unless valentine was with me we were so happy there you see dear and it was there he first told me he loved me no di i couldn't bear newhall without him poor aunt dorothy poor uncle joe feathers when weighed in the scale against a young man whom their niece has known less than a twelvemonth no more was said about charlotte's illness diana was too prudent to alarm her friend by any expression of uneasiness she adopted a cheering tone and the conversation drifted into other channels while diana's concern for her friend's altered health was yet a new feeling she found herself called upon to attend her father once more in the character of a ministering angel and this time captain paget's illness was something more than gout it was according to his doctors he had on this occasion two medical attendants a general breaking up of the system the poor old wanderer the weary odysseus hero of so many trickeries such varied adventures laid himself down to rest within view of the promised land for which his soul yearned he was very ill gustave lenoble who came back to london did not conceal from diana that the illness threatened to end fatally at his instigation the captain had been removed from omega street to pleasant lodgings at the back of knightsbridge road overlooking hyde park this was nearer bayswater and it was very pleasant for the fading old worldling he could see the stream of fashion flowing past as he sat in his easy-chair propped up with pillows with the western sunlight on his face he pointed out the liveries and armorial bearings and told many scandalous and entertaining anecdotes of their past and present owners to gustave lenoble who devoted much of his time to the solacement of the invalid 
everything that affection could do to smooth this dreary time was done for the tired ulysses pleasant books were read to him earnest thoughts were suggested by earnest words hothouse flowers adorned his cheerful sitting-room hothouse fruits gladdened his eye by their rich warmth of colour and invited his parched lips to taste their cool ripeness gustave had a piano brought in so that diana might sing to her father in the dusky may evenings when it should please him to hear her upon the last feeble footsteps of this old man whose life had been very selfish and wicked pity waited with a carefulness so fond and tender that he might well mistake it for love was it fair that his last days should be so peaceful and luxurious when many a good man falls down to die in the streets worn out with the lifelong effort to bear the burden laid upon his weary shoulders in the traditions of the rabbins it is written that those are the elect of god who suffer his chastisement in the flesh for the others for those who on earth drain the goblet of pleasure and ride in the raptures of sin for them comes the dread retribution after death they are plunged in the fire and driven before the wind they take the shape of loathsome reptiles and ascend by infinitesimal degrees through all the grades of creation until their storm-tossed wearied degraded souls re-enter human semblance once more but even then their old standpoint is not yet regained their dread penance not yet performed as men they are the lowest and worst of men slaves toiling in the desert dirt to be trampled under the feet of their prosperous brethren inch by inch the wretched soul regains its lost inheritance cycles must elapse before the awful sentence is fulfilled our christian faith knows no such horrors even for the penitent of the eleventh hour there is promise of pardon the most earnest desire of diana's heart was that her father should enroll himself amongst those late penitents those last among the last who crowd in to the marriage feast half afraid to show their shame darkened faces in that glorious company if we forgive all things to old age so much the more surely do we forgive all injuries to the fading enemy that she had suffered much cruelty and neglect at the hands of her father was a fact that diana could not forget any more than she could forget the name which he had given her it was a part of her life not to be put off or done away with but in these last days with all her heart she forgave and pitied him she pitied him for the crooked paths into which his feet had wandered at the very outset of life and from which so weak a soul could find no issue she pitied him for that moral blindness which had kept him pleasantly unconscious of the supreme depth of his degradation a social laplander who never having seen a western summer had no knowledge that his own land was dark and benighted happily for diana and her generous lover the captain was not a difficult penitent he was indeed a man who having lost the capacity and the need for sin took very kindly to penitence as a species of sentimental luxury yes my dear he said complacently for even in the hour of his penitence he insisted on regarding himself as a social martyr my life has been a very hard one fortune has not been kind to me in the words of the immortal bard my lines have not been set in pleasant places i should have been glad if providence had allowed me to be a better father to you a better husband to your poor mother a better christian in fact and had spared me the repeated humiliation of going through the insolvent debtor's court it is not always easy to understand the justice of these things and it has often appeared to me that something of the favouritism which is the bane of our governments on earth must needs obtain at a higher tribunal one man enters life with an entailed estate worth seventy thousand a year while another finds himself in the hands of the jews before he is twenty years of age there is something in this world amiss shall be unriddled by and by as the poet observes the circumstances of my own existence i have ever regarded as dark and enigmatic and indeed the events of this life are altogether inexplicable my love there is that fellow sheldon now who began life as a country dentist a man without family or connections who well i will not repine 
if i am spared to behold my daughter mistress of a fine estate although in a foreign country i can depart in peace but you must have a house in town my dear yes london must be your headquarters you must not be buried alive in normandy there is no place like london take the word of a man who has seen the finest continental cities and lived in them that is the point my love lived in them for a fine afternoon in the beginning of may an apartment in the champs-elysees or the boulevard is an earthly paradise but the champs-elysees in a wet december the boulevard in a sweltering august london is the only spot upon earth that is never intolerable and your husband will be a rich man my dear girl a really wealthy man and you must see that he makes a fitting use of his wealth and does his duty to society the parable of the talents which you were reading to me this afternoon is a moral lesson your husband must not forget after this fashion did the invalid discourse gustave and diana perceived that he still hoped to have his share in their future life still looked to pleasant days to come in a world which he had loved not wisely but too well nor could they find it in their hearts to tell him that his journey was drawing to a close that on the very threshold of the peaceful home which his diplomatic arts had helped to secure he was to abandon his life's weary race they indulged his hopes a little in order to win him the more easily to serious thoughts but though at times quite ready to abandon himself to a penitential mood that was almost maudlin there were other times when the old adam asserted himself and the captain resented this intrusion of serious subjects as a kind of impertinence i am not aware that i am at my last gasp diana he said with dignity on one of these occasions or that i need to be talked to by my own daughter as if i were on my deathbed. i can show you men some years my senior driving their phaetons and pairs in that park the gospel is all very well in its place during sunday morning service and after morning prayers in your good old county families where the household is large enough to make a fair show at the end of the dining-room without bringing in hulking lads who smell of the stables but i consider that when a man is ill there is a considerable want of tact in bringing the subject of religion before him in any obtrusive manner thus the captain alternated from sentimental penitence to captious worldliness during many days and weeks the business of the haygarthian inheritance was progressing slowly but surely documents were being prepared attested copies of certificates of marriages births baptisms and burials were being procured and always tending towards the grand result once and sometimes twice a week m fleurou came to see captain paget and discuss the great affair with that invalid diplomatist the captain had long ago been aware that in entering upon an alliance with that gentleman he had invoked the aid of a coadjutor likely to prove too strong for him the event had justified his fears m fleurou had something of victor hugo's famous poulpe in his nature powerful as flexible were the arms he stretched forth to grasp all prizes in the way of heirs at law and disputed heritages unclaimed railway stock and forgotten consoles if the captain had not played his cards very cleverly and contrived to obtain a personal influence over gustave lenoble he might have found himself thrust entirely out of the business by one of the frenchman's gelatinous arms happily for his own success however the captain did obtain a strong hold upon gustave this enabled him to protect his own interests throughout the negotiation and to keep the insidious fleurou at bay my good friend he said in his grand carlton house manner i am bound to protect the interests of my friend m lenoble in any agreement to be entered upon in this matter i cannot permit m lenoble's generosity or m lenoble's inexperience to be imposed upon my own interests are of secondary importance that i expect to profit by the extraordinary discovery made by me by me alone and unaided i do not affect to deny but i will not profit at the expense of a too generous friend and what recompense am i to have for my work a work at once painful and impoverishing asked the little frenchman with an angry and suspicious look do you believe that i do that to amuse me to run the streets to go by here by there in hunting the papers of that marriage or this baptism believe you that is so agreeable monsieur the captain no i desire to be paid for my work i must have my part in the heritage which i have helped to win 
it is not one yet we will talk of your recompense by and by we will talk of it this instant upon the field it must that i comprehend where i am in this affair i will not of mystifications or of prevarications or of lies monsieur fleurus cried the captain with a hand stretched towards the bell you will sound you will chase me ah but no you cannot afford to chase me yet i have to find more papers of baptisms and burials go then we will talk of this affair as friends this friendly talk ended in captain paget's complete victory m fleurus consented to accept his costs out of pocket in the present and three per cent of the heritage in the future it was further agreed that the captain should select the english attorney who should conduct m lenoble's case in the court of chancery this conversation occurred at rouen and a day or two afterwards the necessary document was drawn up gustave pledged himself to pay over a fourth share of the haygarthian fortune to horatio paget and three per cent upon the whole amount to jean francois fleurus the document was very formal very complete but whether such an agreement would hold water if gustave lenoble should choose to contest it was open to question the solicitor to whom horatio paget introduced m lenoble was a mr dashwood of the firm of dashwood and vernon a man whom the captain had known in the past and from whom he had received good service in some of the most difficult crises of his difficult career to this gentleman he confided the conduct of the case and explained his apprehensions with regard to the two sheldons you see as the case now stands they think they have the claimant to this money in miss halliday sheldon's stepdaughter but if they got an inkling of susan meynell's marriage and in point of fact the actual state of the case they might try to get hold of my friend gustave lenoble they could not get hold of him mind you dashwood but they would try it on and i don't want trying on of that kind of course not i know sheldon of gray's inn he is rather well say shady that's hardly an actionable epithet and it expresses what i mean your friend's case seems to me tolerably clear that little frenchman is useful but officious it is not a speculative affair i suppose there is money to meet the current expenses of the business yes there is money within reasonable limits my friend is prepared to pay for the advancement of his claims after this the haygarthian business progressed slowly quietly the work was up to this point underground work there were still papers wanting final links of the chain to be fitted together and to the fitting of these links messieurs dashwood and vernon devoted themselves in conjunction with m fleurus this was how matters stood when captain paget drooped and languished and was fain to abandon all active share in the struggle End of chapter one the beginning of sorrow book the seventh chapter two of charlotte's inheritance this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org charlotte's inheritance by mary elizabeth braddon chapter two fading while the invalid in the pleasant lodgings overlooking hyde park grew day by day weaker there was a change as marked in the bright young creature whose loving spirit had first brought the influence of affection to bear upon diana paget's character charlotte halliday was ill very ill it was with every day increasing anxiety that diana watched the slow change slow in its progress but awfully rapid to look back upon the pain the regret with which she noted her father's decay were little indeed compared with the sharp agony which rent her heart as she perceived the alteration in this dear friend the blighting of this fair young flower that the withered leaves of autumn should fall is sad but natural and we submit to the gloomy inevitable fact of decay and death but to see our rose of roses the pride and glory of the garden fade and perish in its midsummer prime is a calamity inexplicable and mysterious diana watched her father's decline with a sense of natural sorrow and pity but there was neither surprise nor horror in the thought that for him the end of all things was drawing nigh 
how different was it with charlotte with that happy soul for whom life and love wore their brightest smile before whose light joyous footsteps stretched so fair a pathway the illness whatever it was and neither mr sheldon nor the portly and venerable physician whom he called in could find a name for it crept upon the patient with stealthy and insidious steps dizziness trembling faintness trembling faintness dizziness the symptoms alternated day by day sometimes there was a respite for a few days and charlotte the youthful the sanguine the happy declared that her enemy had left her i am sure mamma is right di she said on these occasions my nerves are the beginning and end of the mischief and if i could get the better of my nerves i should be as well as ever i don't wonder that the idea of my symptoms makes mamma almost cross you see she has been accustomed to have the symptoms all to herself and for me to plagiarize them as it were must seem quite an impertinence for a strong young thing like me you know di dear who have only just broken myself of plunging downstairs two and three steps at a time and plunging upstairs in the same vulgar manner to intrude on mamma's shattered nerves and pirate mamma's low spirits is utterly absurd and abominable so i have resolved to look my nerves straight in the face and get the better of them my darling you will get the better of them if you try said diana who did at times beguile herself with the hope that her friend's ailments were mental rather than bodily i dare say your monotonous life has something to do with your altered health you want change of scene dear change of scene when i have you and valentine no di it would certainly be very nice to have the background shifted now and then to see capability browns prim gardens melt into alpine heights or southern vineyards or even into russian steppes or hungarian forests one does get a little tired of toujours bays water and mr sheldon and crimped skate and sirloin of beef and the inevitable discussion as to whether it is in a cannibal state of rawness or burnt to a cinder and the glasses of pale sherry and the red worsted doilies and blue finger glasses and the almonds and raisins and crisp biscuits that nobody ever eats and the dreary dreary funereal business of dinner when we all talk vapid nonsense with an ever-present consciousness of the parlour-maid i am tired of the dull dinners and of mamma's peevish complaints about ann woolper's ascendancy downstairs and of mr sheldon's perpetual newspapers that crackle 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 all the evening through and such papers money market monitor stockholders what a make em and all sorts of dreadful things of that kind with not so much as an interesting advertisement in one of them i used never to feel these things an annoyance you know dear till i made the acquaintance of my nerves but from the moment i allowed my nerves to get the better of me all these trifles have worried and excruciated me but i am happy with you darling and i am happy with valentine poor valentine she pronounced his name with a sigh and then after a pause repeated mournfully poor valentine why do you speak of him so sadly dear asked diana very pale because because we have planned such a happy life together dear and is that a thing to be sad about darling and if it should happen after all that we have to part and he go on alone the world may seem so sad and lonely to him charlotte cried diana with a laugh that was almost choked by a sob is this looking your nerves in the face why my dear one this is indeed plagiarism of your mamma's low spirits lotta you shall have change of air yes i am determined on that the stately physician who came in his carriage the other day and who looked at your tongue and said ah and then felt your pulse and said ah again and then called for pen and ink and wrote a little prescription is not the doctor we want for you we want dr yorkshire we want the breezes from the yorkshire moors and the smell of the farmyard and our dear aunt dorothy's syllabubs and our uncle joe to take us for long walks across his clover fields i don't want to go to newhall di i couldn't bear to leave him 
but what is to prevent your meeting him at the white gate this time as you met him last october might not accident take him to huxter's cross again the archaeological work of which we have heard no more by the by might necessitate further investigations in that district if you will go to newhall lotta i will pledge myself for mr hawkehurst's speedy appearance at the white gate you have so often described to me my dearest di you are all kindness but even if i were inclined to go to newhall i doubt if mamma or mr sheldon would like me to go i am sure they would be pleased with any arrangement that was likely to benefit your health but i will talk to your mamma about it i have set my heart on your going to newhall miss paget lost no time in carrying out her idea she took possession of georgie that afternoon while teaching her a new stitch in trico and succeeded in impressing her with the conviction that change of air was necessary for charlotte but you don't think lotta really ill asked mrs sheldon nervously i trust she is not really ill dear mrs sheldon but i am sure she is much changed i affect to think that her illness is only an affair of the nerves but i sadly fear that it is something more than that but what is the matter with her exclaimed georgie with a piteous air of perplexity that is the question which i am always asking people can't be ill you know diana without having something the matter with them and that is what i can't make out in charlotte's case mr sheldon says she wants tone the physician who came in a carriage and pair and ought to know what he is talking about says there is a lack of vigour but what does that all amount to i am sure i have wanted tone all my life perhaps there never was a creature so devoid of tone as i am and the internal sinking i feel just before luncheon is something that no one but myself can realise i dare say lotta is not so strong as she might be but i do not see that she can be ill unless her illness is something definite my poor first husband's illness now was the kind of thing that any one could understand bilious fever the merest child knows what it is to be bilious and the merest child knows what it is to be feverish there can be nothing mysterious in bilious fever but dear mrs sheldon said diana gravely don't you think that the weakness of constitution which rendered charlotte's father liable to be taken off in the prime of life by a fever is a weakness that charlotte may possibly have inherited good heavens diana cried georgie with sudden terror you don't mean to say that you think my charlotte is going to die it was but one step with mrs sheldon from peevish incredulity to frantic alarm and diana found it as difficult to tranquillize her newly awakened fears as it had been to rouse her from absolute apathy change of air yes of course charlotte must have change of air that instant let a cab be sent for immediately to take them to the terminus change of air of course to newhall to nice to the isle of wight to malta mrs sheldon had heard of people going to malta where should they go would diana advise and send for a cab and pack a travelling bag without an instant's delay the rest of the things could be sent afterwards what did luggage matter when charlotte's life was at stake at this point a flood of tears happily relieved poor georgie's excited feelings and then common sense and diana paget came to the rescue my dear mrs sheldon she said with a quiet cheerful tone that went far to reassure the excited lady in the first place we must above all things refrain from any appearance of alarm her illness may after all be only an affair of the nerves and there is certainly no cause for immediate fear georgie was tranquillized and agreed to take matters quietly she promised to arrange charlotte's departure for newhall with mr sheldon that evening of course you know my dear i like to consult him about everything she said out apologetically it is a duty which one owes one's husband you know and a duty which as a young woman about to marry i cannot too much impress upon you but in this case it is quite a matter of form mr sheldon never has objected to charlotte's going to newhall and he is not likely to object now the event proved mrs sheldon mistaken as to this matter georgie proposed the visit to newhall that evening while the two girls were strolling listlessly in the dusky garden and mr sheldon most decidedly rejected the proposition 
if she wants change of air and dr doddleson recommended nothing of the kind newhall is not the place for her why not dear it is too cold northerly aspect no shelter three hundred feet above york minster but dorothy mercer is such a kind motherly creature she'd delight in nursing lotta yes answered mr sheldon with a laugh and in quacking her i know what those good motherly creatures are when they get an excuse for dosing some unhappy victim with their quack nostrums if charlotte went to newhall mrs mercer would pour would make her ten times worse than she is with old woman's remedies besides as i said before the place is too cold that is a conclusive argument i suppose he said this with some impatience of tone and manner there was a haggard look in his face a hurried harassed manner pervading him this evening which had been growing upon him of late georgie was too slow of perception to remark this but diana paget had remarked it and had attributed the change in the stockbroker's manner to a blending of two anxieties he is anxious about money matters she had said to herself and he is anxious about charlotte's health his lips moving in whispered calculations as he sits brooding by the fire tell me of the first anxiety his eyes wandering furtively to his stepdaughter's face every now and then tell me of the second this furtive anxiety of mr sheldon's increased diana paget's anxiety this man who had a certain amount of medical knowledge could no doubt read the diagnostics of that strange insidious illness which had as yet no name diana furtively watching his furtive looks told herself that he read of danger if charlotte wants change of air let her go to hastings he said that is the kind of place for an invalid i want rest myself and there's such utter stagnation in the city nowadays that i can very well afford to give myself a holiday we'll run down to hastings or the immediate neighbourhood of hastings for a week or two oh philip how kind and considerate you are i am sure as i was observing to miss paget only to-day you ah by the by there's miss paget is it absolutely necessary that miss paget should go to hastings with us well dear you see she has so kindly desired to remain with me for the quarter so as to give me time to turn round you know with regard to caps and summer things and so on for really she has such taste and does strike out such excellent ideas about turning and dipping and dying that i don't know what will become of me when she leaves us and it would look so pointed to yes she had better go with us but why all this fuss about charlotte who put it into your head that she wants change of air mr sheldon evidently considered it an established fact that any idea in his wife's head must needs have been put there by some one or other well you see diana and i were talking of lotta this afternoon and diana quite alarmed me how so asked mr sheldon with a quick frown why she said it was evident by the fact of poor dear tom's dying of a fever that his constitution must have been originally weak and she said that perhaps charlotte had inherited tom's weak constitution and frightened me dreadfully there is no occasion for you to be frightened charlotte will get on very well i dare say with care but miss paget is a very sensible young woman and is right in what she says charlotte's constitution is not strong oh philip said georgie in a faint wailing voice i dare say she will live to follow you and me to our graves said mr sheldon with a hard laugh ah here she is here she was coming towards the open window near which her stepfather sat here she was pale and tired with her sauntering walk dressed in white and spectral in the gloaming to the sad eyes of her mother she looked like a ghost to the eyes of philip sheldon a man not prone to poetic fancies she looked even more ghost-like end of chapter two fading book the seventh chapter three of charlotte's inheritance this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org charlotte's inheritance by mary elizabeth braddon chapter three mrs woolper is anxious 
since the beginning of her illness charlotte halliday had been the object and subject of many anxious thoughts in the minds of several people that her stepfather had his anxieties about her anxieties which he tried to hide was obvious to the one person in the bayswater villa who noted his looks and tried to read the thoughts they indicated mrs sheldon's alarm once fairly awakened was not to be lulled to rest and in valentine hawkehurst's heart there was an aching pain a dull dead load of care which had never been lightened from the hour when he first perceived the change in his dear one's face there was one other person an inhabitant of the bayswater villa who watched charlotte halliday at this time with a care as unresting as the care of mother or stepfather bosom friend or plighted lover this person was anne woolper mrs woolper had come to the villa prepared to find in miss halliday a frivolous self-satisfied young person between whom and an old broken-down woman like herself there could be no sympathy she had expected to be contemptuously or at the best indifferently entreated by the prosperous well-placed young lady whom mr sheldon had spoken of as a good girl as girls go a vague species of commendation which to the mind of mrs woolper promised very little as clearly as philip sheldon dared express his wishes with regard to charlotte halliday he had expressed them to anne woolper what he would fain have said was watch my stepdaughter and keep me well acquainted with every step she takes this much he dared not say but by insinuating that tom halliday's daughter was frivolous and reckless and that her lover was not to be trusted he had contrived to put mrs woolper on the qui viva mr phillips afraid she may go and marry this young man on the sly before he's got the means to support a wife she said to herself as she meditated upon the meaning of her master's injunctions and well he may be there's no knowing what young women are up to nowadays and the more innocent and inexperienced a young woman is the more she wants looking after and miss georgie craddock always was a poor fondy up to naught but dressing herself fine and streaming up and down barlingford high street with her old schoolfellows such as she ain't fit to be trusted with a daughter and mr philip knows that he always was a deep one but i'm glad he looks after missy there's many men having got fast hold of the father's brass would let the daughter marry old scratch for the sake of getting rid of her this is how mrs woolper argued the matter she came of a prudent race and anything like prudence seemed to her a commendable virtue she wished to think well of her master for her he had been a providence in the hour of calamity and old age where else could she look if not to him and to suspect him or think ill of him was to reject the one refuge offered to her distress a magnanimous independence of spirit is not an easy virtue for the old and friendless and poor the drowning wretch will scarcely question the soundness of the plank that sustains him upon the storm-tossed billows nor was mrs woolper inclined to question the motives of the men to whom she now owed her daily bread it is possible that before invoking mrs woolper from the ashes of the past to take her seat by the hearthstone of the present mr sheldon may have contemplated the question of her return in all its bearings and may have assured himself that she was his own by a tie not easily broken his bond-slave fettered hand and foot by the bondage of necessity what choice can she have except the choice between my house and the workhouse he may naturally have asked himself and is it likely she will quarrel with her bread and butter in order to fall back upon dry bread mr sheldon contemplating this and all other questions from his one unchanging standpoint may reasonably have concluded that mrs woolper would do nothing opposed to her own interests and that so long as it suited her interest to remain at the lawn and to serve him she would there remain his docile and unquestioning slave the influence of affection the force of generous impulse were qualities that did not come into mr sheldon's calculations upon this subject 
his addition and subtraction division and multiplication were all based on one system that happy and unconscious art by which charlotte halliday made herself dear to all who knew her had a speedy effect upon the old housekeeper the girl's amiable consideration for her age and infirmities the pretty affectionate familiarity with which she treated this countrywoman who had known her father and who could talk to her of yorkshire and yorkshire people soon made their way to nancy woolper's heart of hearts for miss halliday to come to the housekeeper's room with some message from her mother and to linger for a few minutes chat was a delight to mrs woolper she would have detained the bright young visitant for hours instead of minutes if she could have found any excuse for so doing nor was there any treason against mr sheldon in her growing attachment to his stepdaughter whenever nancy spoke of that master and benefactor she spoke with unfeigned gratitude and affection i nursed your step-papa as a baby miss halliday she said very often on these occasions you wouldn't think to look at him now that he ever was that would you but he was one of the finest babies you could wish to see tall and strong and with eyes that pierced one through they were so bright and big and black he was rather stubborn spirited with his teething but what baby isn't trying at such times i had rare work with him i can tell you miss walking him about of nights and jogging him till there wasn't a jog left in me as you may say from sleepiness i often wonder if he thinks of this now when i see him looking so grave and stern but you see being jogged doesn't impress the mind like having to jog and though i can bring that time back as plain as if it was yesterday with the very nursery i slept in at barlingford and the rush light in a tall iron cage on the floor and the shadow of the cage on the bare whitewashed walls it's clean gone out of his mind i dare say i'm afraid it has nancy but oh i was fond of him miss halliday and what i went through with him about his teeth made me only the fonder of him he was the first baby i ever nursed you see and the last for before master george came to town i'd taken to the cooking and mrs sheldon hired another girl as nurse a regular softy she was and it isn't her fault that master george has got anything christian-like in the way of a back for the way she carried that blessed child used to make my blood run cold thus would mrs woolper discourse whenever she had a fair excuse for detaining miss halliday in her comfortable apartment charlotte did not perceive much interest in these reminiscences of mr sheldon's infancy but she was much too kind to bring them abruptly to a close by any show of impatience when she could get nancy to talk of barlingford and highly and the people whom charlotte herself had known as a child the conversation was really interesting and these recollections formed a link between the old woman and the fair young damsel when the change arose in charlotte's health and spirits mrs woolper was one of the first to perceive it she was skilled in those old woman's remedies which mr sheldon held in such supreme contempt and she would fain have dosed the invalid with nauseous decoctions of hops or home-brewed quinine charlotte appreciated the kindness of the intent but she rebelled against the home-brewed medicines and pinned her faith to the more scientific and less obnoxious preparations procured from the chemists for some time nancy made light of the girl's ailments though she watched her with unfailing attention you ain't a done growin yet miss i'll lay she said but i'm more than twenty-one nancy people don't grow after they're of age do they i've known them as have miss i don't say it's common but it has been done and then there's the weakness that comes after you've done growing girls of your age are apt to be faint and lollipy like as you may say especially when they're stived up in a smoky place like london you ought to go to highly miss where you was born that's the place to set you up the time had come when the change was no longer matter for doubt day by day charlotte grew weaker and paler day by day that bright and joyous creature whose presence had made an atmosphere of youth and gladness even in that prim dwelling-place receded farther into the dimness of the past until to think of what she had been seemed like recalling the image of the dead nancy marked the alteration with a strange pain so sharp so bitter that its sharpness and bitterness were a perpetual perplexity to her if the poor dear young thing is meant to go there's no need for me to fret about it all day long and wake up sudden in the night with cold water standing out upon my forehead at the thought of it 
i haven't known her six months and if she is pretty and sweet-spoken it's not my place to give way at the thoughts of losing her she's not my own flesh and blood and i've sat by to watch them go times and often without feeling as i do when i see the change in her day after day why should it seem so dreadful to me why indeed this was a question for which mrs woolper could find no answer she knew that the pain and horror which she felt were something more than natural but beyond this point her thoughts refused to travel a superstitious feeling arose at this point to usurp the office of reason and she accounted for the strangeness of miss halliday's illness as she might have done had she lived in the sixteenth century and been liable to the suspicion of nocturnal careerings on broomsticks i'm sorry mr phillips's house should be unlucky to that sweet young creep she said to herself it was unlucky to the father and now it seems as if it was going to be unlucky to the daughter and mr phillip won't be any richer for her death mrs sheldon has told me times and often that all tom halliday's money went to my master when she married him and he has doubled and trebled it by his cleverness miss charlotte's death wouldn't bring him a sixpence this was the gist of mrs woolper's meditations very often nowadays but the strange sense of perplexity the nameless fear the vague horror were not to be banished from her mind a sense of some shapeless presence for ever at her side haunted her by day and night what was it what did its presence portend it was as if a figure shrouded from head to foot was there dark and terrible at her elbow and she would not turn to meet the horror face to face sometimes the phantom hand lifted a corner of the veil and the shade said look at me see who and what i am you have seen me before i am here again and this time you shall not refuse to meet me face to face i am the shadow of the horror you suspected in the past the shadowy fears which oppressed mrs woolper during this period did not in any way lessen her practical usefulness from the commencement of charlotte's slow decline she had shown herself attentive and even officious in all matters relating to the invalid with her own hands she decanted the famous port which georgie fetched from the particular bin in mr sheldon's carefully arranged cellar when the physician was called in and wrote his harmless little prescription it was mrs woolper who carried the document to the dispensing chemist and brought back the innocent potion which might peradventure effect some slight good and was too feeble a decoction to do any harm charlotte duly appreciated all this kindness but she repeatedly assured the housekeeper that her ailments were not worthy of so much care it was mrs woolper whom mr sheldon employed to get lodgings for the family when it had been ultimately decided that a change to the seaside was the best cure for miss halliday i am too busy to go to hastings myself this week he said but i shall be prepared to spend a fortnight there after next monday what i want you to do nancy is to slip down to-morrow with a second-class return ticket and look about for a nice place for us i don't care about being in hastings there's too much cockneyism in the place at this time of year there's a little village called harold's hill within a mile or so of st leonard's a dull out-of-the-way place but rustic and picturesque and all that kind of thing the sort of place that women like now i'd rather stay at that place than at hastings so you can take a fly at the station drive straight to harold's hill and secure the best lodgings you can get you think as the change of air will do miss halliday good asked mrs woolper anxiously after she had promised to do all her kind master required of her do i think it will do her good of course i do sea air and sea bathing will set her up in no time there's nothing particular the matter with her no mr philip that's what bothers me about the whole thing there's nothing particular the matter with her and yet she pines and dwindles and dwindles and pines till it makes one's heart ache to see her philip sheldon's face darkened and he threw himself back in his chair with an impatient movement if he had chosen to do so he could have prevented that darkening of his face but he did not consider mrs woolper a person of sufficient importance to necessitate the regulation of his countenance what was she but an ignorant obstinate old woman who would most probably perish in the streets if he chose to turn her out of doors there are men who consider their clerks and retainers such very dirt that they would continue the forging of a bill of exchange or complete the final touches of a murder 
with a junior clerk putting coals on the fire or an errand boy standing cap in hand on the threshold of the door they cannot realize the fact that dirt such as this is flesh and blood and may denounce them by and by in a witness box of all contingencies mr sheldon least expected that this old woman could prove troublesome to him this abject wretch whose daily bread depended on his will he could not imagine that there are circumstances under which such abject creatures will renounce their daily bread and die of hunger rather than accept the means of life from one hateful hand if you want to know anything about miss halliday's illness he said in his hardest voice and with his hardest look you had better apply to dr doddleson the physician who has prescribed for her i do not attend her you see and i am in no way responsible for her health when i was attending her father you favoured me by doubting my skill if i judged rightly as to your tone and manner on one occasion i don't want to be brought to book by you mrs woolper about miss halliday's altered looks or miss halliday's illness i have nothing to do with either how should i think you had sir don't be angry with me or hard upon me mr phil i nursed you when you was but a baby and you're nearer and dearer to me than any other master could be why i have but to shut my eyes now and i can feel your little hand upon my neck as it used to lie there so soft and dear and then i look down at the hand on the table strong and dark and clenched so firm and i ask myself can it be the same for the sake of that time mr phil don't be hard upon me there's nothing i wouldn't do to serve you there's nothing you could do that would turn me from you there's no man living in this world sir that oughtn't to be glad to know of one person that nothing can turn from him that's a very fine sentiment my good soul replied mr sheldon coolly but you see it's only an ex parte statement and as the case stands there is no opportunity for the display of those fine feelings you talk about you happen to want a home in your old age and i happen to be able to give you a home under such circumstances your own good sense will show you that all sentimental talk about standing by me and not turning away from me is absolute bosh the old woman sighed heavily she had offered her master a fidelity which involved the abnegation of all impulses of her own heart and mind and he rejected her love and her service and then after the first dreary sense of his coldness she felt better pleased that it should be so the man who spoke to her in this harsh uncompromising way could have no cause to fear her in the mind of such a man there could surely be no secret chamber within which she had with his knowledge almost penetrated i won't trouble you any more sir she said mournfully i dare say i'm a foolish old woman you are nancy we don't get wiser as we grow older you see and when we let our tongues wag we're apt to talk nonsense the quieter you keep your tongue the better for yourself in more ways than one to a useful old woman about the place i've no objection but a chattering old woman i will not have at any price after this everything was settled in the most agreeable manner nancy woolper's journey to hastings was fully arranged and early the next morning she started brisk and active in spite of her sixty-eight years of age she returned at night having secured very pleasant lodgings at the village of harold's hill and a very sweet place it is my dear miss lotta she said to charlotte the next day when she described her adventures the apartments are at a farmhouse overlooking the sea and the smell of the cows under your windows and the sea breezes blowing across the farmyard can't fail to bring the colour back to your pretty cheeks and the brightness back to your pretty eyes End of chapter three mrs woolper is anxious